It's a pleasure to be up here sharing what's on God's heart for us today. It feels like it's been a day and an age since last I preached. Owen is looking decidedly rather nervous at the front here. No, man. No. Well, you should be. Uh, where's Marg as well? Oh, how are you doing? You all right? Good stuff. Um, I think actually everybody in here knows me, so... Hello, it's awesome to see you. Welcome to, welcome to church, welcome to the family. I don't need to make a formal introduction. And I love uh, that we're in this series on revival. And it's been such a joy um, this week and, and the weeks leading up uh, for me to be studying what revival is, to be listening to the guys talk about revival and, yeah, and what it is and what have you. And I don't know about you guys, but those fluttering flames of sort of passion are starting to build up within me, and I hope they are in you too, because what I see is that God is on the move on the Isle of Man. What I see is that he has made us a promise which he intends to keep. And can I encourage us that actually for the foreseeable future, we heard it in the family news, that every Friday, as as the the, the southern churches, we're going to come together to commit to praying in revival on the island. And, and can I encourage you, don't miss out on that, because if it does break out from one of those meetings, like we've heard earlier, you'll regret it. Um, and actually, I had the, the pleasure of, of actually holding it in my house, and it was really, really uh, powerful. And something I wanted to start on today, the, the, the title of this preach is all about God's personal call in our lives, our personal call to see revival in. And did you all know that you are all called. Um, and if you don't, I'm going to prove it. If we turn to John 15, 16, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide. So that wherever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So you're called. You didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose you. He chose you for the fruit that you will bear in his kingdom. It's like when you start a new job. You're given a contract. And what that contract does is it divvies up what your employer's responsibilities is over you and what your responsibilities are within that job. And you sign it and that's how you then work. And so many people come to the Lord, and I love watching people come to the Lord and go, oh, this is amazing. I get to, I, everything in my life is lining up. There's peace where there was brokenness. There's healing where there was, there was death, where the sin was. Actually, I have freedom, and they want to park up in that place. But what they don't realize at the time, and what we have to kind of guide them into, is they actually have a job to do. They are called to then Go. And I love it, I love it. And something Jonathan Stanfield, when I was intern, told me, it was like, when we come to Jesus, in front of us, between him and us, there's a door. And that door is forgiveness, repentance, and and the grace and the mercy, and we step through it. But it's not a one-way door. It doesn't swing open and then shut behind us. It's a revolving door. Because as we come in, we experience the grace. As we walk to Jesus, we experience the grace and the love and the forgiveness he has. But very quickly, we we find ourselves turned around and going back out in the opposite direction. Because we have a job to do on this earth. So So can I ask you all please to turn to Isaiah 6. And this is where we're going to be taking uh, this idea of being called from. Um... And just as a bit of historical background for you, Isaiah was a prophet, a Hebrew prophet for the Lord about 700 years before the coming of Christ. And he prophesied the coming of Christ. Um, And what we read in Isaiah 6 is kind of his start as a prophet. It was the first vision he had that got him on the path um, that he was on. It's because of this vision that we we have the book um, in scriptures called Isaiah. So please read with me, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Now we're just going to stop there for a wee second. Because if that doesn't capture your attention, I don't know what will. He saw the Lord on his throne. We're so quick to read things like that and go, ah, very good. He saw the Lord in all his majesty, in all his glory. He saw the Lord sat upon his throne. And when I read this, it went, grabbed me by the throat. And I was like, ah. 
fabulous, marvelous. I cried, like, he saw the Lord, like, what I would give to see the Lord, to be swept up to see the Lord in all his glory. But we carry on. It says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And I'm again going to stop at this point in this scripture. Because as a younger Christian, I had no clue what Lord of hosts meant. I really didn't. And what I imagined was, God threw some pretty wild dinner parties. Lord of hosts. Angels walking around with canapes, not champagne, but milk and honey. <laughs> and what I learned very quickly is that's not what it means. What it means, um, the word hosts uh, refers to the armies of heaven. The angelic hosts are God's army. So when they say, holy, holy, holy to the Lord of hosts, they're declaring in that moment, holy, 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 to the general of generals, to the master of all the armies of heaven, to the commander of commanders. To put it in our terms, he's the guy, say in the British army, who says, that's the town we're taking next. This is the ground I want us to see, I want to see us take. This is where base camp sets. When he gives the order, the angels do as they're told. But we carry on. It says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook, and the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. How are we doing, guys? Welcome. How are you doing there? All right. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. There it is again. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to these people. This is a pretty intense vision, I think. Pretty intense. To be swept up into God's presence. To see him um, on his throne. And to see him referred to as the Lord of hosts, the commander of all the armies of heaven. And I love Isaiah's response. To me, it's the only appropriate response you can give when you actually come face to face with the Lord God. He says, woe is me. He understands in a moment he is not worthy to be in the presence of our God. He doesn't run up to him and go, high five, Lord. Doesn't give him a hug. He says, woe is me. He understood that he was unclean. Yeah, he was a person of unclean lips. When we come to the Lord, uh, we have to start with that understanding. We have to start with that understanding. Because when we understand that we are unclean, then we understand we need his forgiveness and his grace. Yeah, so and revival will only start when his people are forgiven and purified. It will only start when his people are forgiven and purified. See, God's plan for us in here and for everybody out that door is that none shall perish, but all, all, just take that into account. The billions of people, or billion, I, can't, I don't, didn't research how many people there is in the world, but however many it is, not, 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 that not one of them should perish, but all come to have eternal life through his son, Jesus. We read in verse 6 and 7, Then one seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I love, I love the reflection of Scripture. How Scripture just backs itself all the time. Because in the New Testament, Jesus says, If you confess before men with your mouth that I am Lord of your life, I will confess you before my Father. Yeah, 
If we want to confess to people that Jesus is Lord, we have to have that burning coal put to our mouth. We have to be purified. We have to be forgiven. Because if we do it and we're not, sin is just going to undermine everything we do. Any foundation we lay, anything we build, the moment there's pressure on it, it's going to crumble. Because we have to be forgiven. We have to be purified. We have to work out God's forgiveness and God's grace in every area of our lives so that when we say to a person, look, Jesus is my Lord and Master. He is the Master of my life. Um, It's not undermined. We speak not just with our words, but our life reflects what we say. Yes. Amen. For a confession of faith to mean something or make a difference in the world, our lips have to be pure. We have to be living, living a life that talks of a devotion to the Lord. And if we have truly met him, then we will live lives and allow his purifying grace to do a good work in us so that we will bear fruit for him. And we read in verses 8 and 9, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, Go and say to these people. See, when we come to the Lord, like I said earlier, you don't just get to park up. You don't just get to go, yes, this is amazing. I just want to spend all my time worshipping and all my time um, just, just feeling the, uh, the complete love. And he loves us no matter where we go. And one day we will get to bask in his glory. One day we will get to bask in his glory for all of eternity. But right now we have a job to do. He said, he, what he asks, whom shall I send and who will go for us? The other thing we have to realize for revival in this moment is he poses that question to each one of us and revival can come about through any one of us. Yes. Any one of us. Thank you, Jesus. See, in Life Group a wee while ago, we, um, not last week, week before, we listened to a, an interview, a half an hour interview with a guy who'd studied revivals, and I was wrapped with it. Must have looked like I fell asleep, but I did, I was listening. Um, <laughs> I was completely and utterly wrapped, listening to this guy talk about um, the, the Northern Irish... Uh, Revival, the Hebrides, the Welsh, and ha- how it went across the world. But what really caught my attention was an excerpt from a man's diary that was read in this lovely Welsh brogue, which I can't do. Um, but it was this man who instigated the 1904 Welsh Revival. And the excerpt from his, rev- uh, from his uh, uh, diary was um, that every night he would go to prayer meetings in different churches. It didn't matter if it was his or not, he went to prayer meetings. If there was a prayer meeting there, he was there. And he writes in his diary, sometimes he'd see the men, he'd see his friends and his, uh, his fellow workmates going off on the boats to go fishing, and he'd feel a yearning like, surely one night oh, I can just go and take off. And uh, he never did. The reason being, he had a God-given conviction to pray. And you have to understand, this isn't an elder or a deacon within a church. It's not an Andrew Sally or a Jonathan Stanfield. It's a, it's a Zebedee. It's a Zebedee Graham. Jackie, it's a you. Yeah, very good, yeah. It's George's and Owen's unborn child. Woo! Yeah. Now, I did ask permission to share that, but I hope you didn't think I was going to get away with it. Yeah. Still cross that you told Anastasia before me, but it's all good. Uh, see, our willingness to listen to what God asks of us after we come to him, it's all the qualification we need to see revival break out. Yeah. Our willingness to act upon his word and his will. You know? And these first two points I've kind of gone through, I kind of got, I've gone through real quick, and uh, I've tried, I hope that I've explained them well, but the reason I've gone quick is because they're quite simple. Most of you in here will know, yeah, of course I need to be forgiven of the Lord. Of course I need to be pure in order for what I do for the Lord to stand. Of course I I understand we're called. It says in the Great Commission, go and make disciples. We know, but what I'm really excited about is this next point. And it's awesome when God kind of goes away and says it before you anyway. Um, But it's, do you feel the call, family? Or rather, are you ready? And don't say you are ready if you're not. Because I'm going to go through what uh, being ready looks like. There's two different ways... You, to be ready. And I'm going to ask uh, 
Daniel Miller, would you come up for me? Now, I haven't prepped these guys. Um, let's go for Pharrell as well. Awesome. Whoop, whoop. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get these guys just to stand here and face one another. You stand there, you come and face him. And what they're going to do is they're going to wrestle for us, and oh, it's going to be amazing. Oh, yes. But you've got quite a long ways to fall, whereas you don't. So just kneel for me, guys, because I don't want you to hurt yourselves. First one on the back loses. Are you ready? Yeah. Go. <laughs> come on, come on. What's this? Come on. Somebody's got to go. Come on, Matt. Watch your head. Oh, my God. Come on now. Don't make me step in here. <laughs> All right, okay, that's enough, that's enough. We'll call it a tie. Thank you very much, gents. You may go and sit back. Hey, well, a silly demonstration, um, but for me, I love, I love a good wrestle. Like, I, I did my... Oh, Altus, yeah, come on. <laughs> Originally, I did ask Altus to come and do it with me, but I thought he'd do that and say, go away. Um, <laughs> The reason I show that is because actually it's quite fun to do a bit of a wrestle and the first time this was shown to me and I saw the guys I was going to wrestle, I was like, oh yes, this is going to be fab. But they stopped us. They stopped us and what they said to us was, this is what you should be doing in the quiet space. Yeah. Is wrestling with God. You should be before God going, God please, save him Lord. I raise my family to you. I raise the people in the shops, the people on the streets. I raise them to you. That should not be a one-off thing for us. That should be a daily thing. Yeah. We should be on our knees pleading with the Lord. Pleading with him. So if we won't come, we're not ready if we're not doing that. We're not ready if we're not doing that. We're not living up to the calling. If we are not on our knees going, please, Jesus. The guy from Wales in the 1904 revival. God gave him conviction to pray, and he prayed every day, every day without fail. And the, uh, if I remember correctly, the, the, the reaches of that revival went to India. Yeah. Thousands came to know him. Yeah. Thousands came to know him because he understood, I have to pray. It's the backbone of what we do, everything. Our call to revival starts on our knees. Yeah. I love it. We read in Acts. I, whoa, this, is, this is amazing. Right, Acts, right? Um, you've got the apostles, and they've been through the works. Jesus has died, and they've kind of scattered, and then they've, he's come back, and they've gone, oh, fabulous, marvelous. But then he tells them he's going again. But what he says in that moment is, I'm going, but I will send you a helper. I promise you a helper. Now, I don't know about you, when I order a post, when I order a package from Amazon or something, I'm like this, it's coming soon. Fab. I even messaged the guys I live with, Andy and Ivan, like, any post chance, guys? Because I'm excited. <laughs> and, and, and the apostles, they were the, they were the same, the, the 12. They, when the, when the, the helper arrives, they weren't at their home twiddling their thumbs. They weren't sat on their laurels. They didn't go back to their normal lives. They, were, they met and were praying to the Lord. Amen. They were praying. That's how we're going to see it. Yeah. That's what it is to be called, to understand our calling is to be praying. They understood it. And the, uh, the Holy Spirit came and their numbers were added to greatly. Yeah. Greatly. And we read, we continue to read in the verse at the very end there. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to these people. Now if you remember, um, the Lord of hosts, which is used twice in that passage, is about him as a commander, as the commander of the, 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 the armies of heaven. See, he's not saying to Isaiah, why don't you pop off to the shops and get me a pint of milk or some eggs? He's not sending him on some small errand. He's giving him a, a battle order. Whom will go and fight for me in this place? Who shall go for us? Yeah. See, when we pray... What we're doing is strapping a sword to our side. It's putting the shield on our arm. It's putting on the, the helmet, the, the breastplate, the, the gloves and greaves. It's preparing ourselves for battle so that when we get up from our quiet space, we go into the world, we go into our workplaces, we go in to the shops and to the streets and we tell them about the love of Jesus. We confess the Lord with our mouths so that they may know the love that he has for them. So the Holy Spirit may work in them. That's the other part of the calling, is to go out and tell people of the good news that Jesus brings. Yeah. 
You know, as a church, we go to Brazil, South Africa, we, we go, we've been to Poland, we've been to Switzerland, and that's amazing, and we, when we see those chances, we need to do it, we need to go. But in this moment, your call is not just for there, but it's for the people you come across. It's in the workplaces, in the workplaces. My family, my, my little sister, a lot of you know, Katie is saved. My dad gave his life before he died, the rest of them not saved. You can imagine, I pray for them. I pray for them. My dad only gave his life because I spent years praying for him and telling him, you need to know the Lord. And the thing is, when revival hits, family, when revival hits in this place, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. People are going to be streaming in those doors. It's going to be so full in here. You're going to be sweating it out. We're going to open the doors and open air preaching. The, the, the air in Castellan will be thick. I'll go to work in Castellan and kids will be saved. We'll see people prophesy, healed, raised from the dead. But if we aren't going now Amen. to spread the word, then we'll never get there. That's good, really. We'll never get there. Your calling is for now. It's not for then. It's not for 10 years from now, although revival may take that long. We have to be doing these things now. On our knees and then we have to go. And I want to call a response. I want to call a response for us, family. And I wonder if we could uh, stand and come and just join me at the front here, if you would. Don't be shy, I'm standing up as well. The reason I want to call you forward it's because we can't just sit back and go, okay, now we'll sing a song, we'll go and eat some tea and cake and coffee and leave this place. And, you know, I'll meditate on what Ben has said. No, no, God is calling you. He's posing the question to us now that he posed to Isaiah. Who will go? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us in this moment? What's our response got to be, family? Yeah. Send me! I will do it! So when I ask, family, when I ask, Dare we shout our response? Because I bet Isaiah didn't go, yeah, go on, Lord, yeah, I'll do it. Fab, yeah, no. Send me, Lord! So will you, will you, will you shout with me? Will you, will you answer the call with me? Can I ask if somebody perhaps plays a little something, something in the background as well, and we can respond in that way afterwards? But I'm going to ask us, what I'm going to ask is, will you go? And your response should be yes. Don't do it lightly. But your response should be, yes, Lord, send me. Are you ready, family? Yeah, yeah Jesus. Will you go? Yes, yes Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Will you go? Yes, yes Lord. Yes, Will you go? Yes, yes Lord. Yes. Amen. Shall we worship and respond? Yes. 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 Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen.